American News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehayas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. Whether you look at things like the number of journalists in prison, uh, where Egypt has been for many years among the top three or top five jailers uh, in the world. Hossam Bagat, the executive director of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, talking about media freedom in Egypt ahead of World Press Freedom Day tomorrow. Details coming up. Also, Sudan's warring factions reportedly agreed to a seven-day ceasefire starting Thursday. And in Kenya, cult leaders face court charges on the deaths of more than a hundred followers. These stories and more on African News tonight. That will last for humanitarian access. We start with our top story. Today, South Sudan's government said. Sudan's warring military factions have agreed in principle today to a seven-day ceasefire starting Thursday and is offering to mediate the talks. Previous truces have fallen apart amid rocket and rifle fire, raising questions whether a week-long ceasefire will last and provide the time for peace talks. The battle pits Sudan's army under General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan against the paramilitary rapid support forces of, by, led by General Mohammed Hamdan Dagola. They had controlled the military-led government for two years but fell out last month in talks to create a civilian-led administration. Pauline Adhong is the spokesperson at South Sudan's Foreign Affairs Ministry. She spoke today with VOA's Nabil Biagio about the plan for a ceasefire and talks. That will allow for humanitarian access, safety for Sudanese civilians, evacuation of foreign nationals, and restocking of medical and food supplies. His Excellency President Safakir Mayadid advised that these extensions should be taken as the opportunity for serious engagement of the parties and to lay framework for the preliminary face-to-face talks by the parties as an, uh, at an agreed venue. Uh, let me just interject here quickly. I'm looking at the uh, sides of these uh, warring parties, especially the RSF, and uh, a few hours ago they're talking about fighting and downing a plane and South Sudan is announcing that uh, there is going to be a seven-day ceasefire. Can you give me the backdrop to this ceasefire that uh, the South Sudanese government, uh, Salva Kirmayar, did, has secured with the two leaders? We are hoping that uh, with this uh, ceasefire that has been agreed by two principals, we are hoping both of them will be able to honor um, the, 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 the issues of uh, bombardment, including the air, airport. We are hoping that this will be able to hold, and they will allow in, uh, you know, access to movement, uh, access to humanitarian, and other things that uh, are necessary for the citizens of Sudan and other nationals that may want to leave the country. Yeah, what is the next step for President Salva Kiir if uh, the two leaders uh, have agreed to to respect a seven-day ceasefire? Now, the plan is that they will be able to nominate uh, representatives to come and talk face-to-face. Uh, the only thing that has not been agreed at the moment is where will these representatives sit and do the talking. Uh, previously, President Keir has proposed uh, Juba or any other place, any other country of their choice within the region. Uh, the most important thing here is for the party to sit and talk because uh, we believe, as a country, President Keir believes the only way to end this uh, ongoing conflict is by talking by talking and agreeing to resolve the, 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 the issue. These two uh, generals, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and uh, General Mohammed Hamdan Dagulu, uh, they have uh, agreed to several ceasefires in the past uh, two weeks, and uh, the ceasefires have been violated repeatedly. What makes this one different, this one that you are telling us President Kier has uh, got them to agree 
there's too much pressure from the region and there's too much pressure from all, including the Gulf and uh, UK, uh, America as well. A call for ceasefire, a call for uh, solution to this conflict. So we believe uh, this 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 has an impact on them. And also, I believe that they are, they're also beginning to see the magnitude of the damage that is causing. That was uh, Pauline Adhong, the spokesperson at South Sudan's Foreign Affairs Ministry. She spoke with VOA's Nabil Biagio today. United Nations officials today said they are rushing to get aid to civilians caught in Sudan's brutal war now in its third week and said the conflict is creating a massive humanitarian crisis. Despite the announced extension of a ceasefire on Sunday, there are reports of gunfire and explosions across the capital Khartoum today and the latest ceasefire announced by South Sudan won't begin until Thursday. In Geneva today, the spokesperson for the UN High Commission for Refugees, Olga Sarado, said several agencies are preparing for a massive flow of refugees. So over 100,000 refugees are estimated to be among those who have now crossed to neighboring countries, including Sudanese refugees, South Sudanese returning, and other nationalities who were themselves refugees in Sudan. Alongside governments and partners, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, has determined an initial planning figure of more than 800,000 refugees and returnees that may, be, they, that may flee Sudan to neighboring countries. Many Sudanese have fled into Chad, Egypt and South Sudan. Thousands have managed to join foreign nationals on evacuation ships or flights. Paul Dillon is the spokesperson for the International Organization for Migration. At least 334,000 people have been internally displaced within Sudan as a result of the fighting um, since the 15th of April, according to uh, IOM's displacement tracking matrix network report, which was released last night and uh, has been uh, disseminated to uh, media here in Geneva. Uh, The number of displaced people through the last two weeks exceeds, as as a result of conflict, Uh, exceeds all conflict-related displacements reported in Sudan in 2022, just to give you a a sense of the scale of movement uh, since April 15. Tariq Yasirovich, the World Health Organization spokesperson, said the WHO is rushing to get medical aid to Sudan. We have six containers of supplies for the treatment of injuries and the treatment of se- severe acute malnutrition that were dispatched by sea and are currently being moved to warehouses in Port Sudan. Uh, we have uh, another 30 metric tons of emergency supplies to be flown from our logistic hub in Dubai as soon as this becomes possible. The aid agencies warned they already are facing a funding shortfall, which has been worsened this year by extreme drought in much of eastern Africa, as well as the conflict in Ukraine. And... Annual report on press freedom for 2023 said the Egyptian media sector is dominated by pro-government outlets. Most critical or opposition-oriented outlets have been shut down. Several Egyptian laws allow authorities to censor online content and block any website deemed to be a threat to national security. Hossam Bagat is the executive director of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights and an investigative journalist at the independent Mada Massar, an online newspaper. Ahead of the World Press Freedom Day tomorrow, he spoke with VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shanawi about the situation in Egypt. Egypt has never really been a country with free and unrestricted media. Egyptian journalists have always, since the 1950s, uh, suffered from various uh, forms of uh, harassment and restrictions and censorship and sometimes imprisonment. But what happened in the last 10 years under President Sisi is that Egypt has moved from a country with problematic practices and violations of press freedom into one of the worst violators of 
of press freedom in the whole world. Whether you look at things like the number of journalists in prison, uh, where Egypt has been for many years among the top three or top five jailers uh, in the world, the media ownership, where again, for the very first time in the history of Egyptian journalism in 200 years, really, we have the vast majority of media outlets now directly purchased and owned by the General Intelligence Service, which set up its own media company, United Media Services, that is publicly known to be owned uh, by intelligence. And uh, that uh, leaves only a handful, really, of independent, uh, privately owned uh, media outlets that 100% of are now blocked. Uh, So the very few independent media platforms that have not been shut down or purchased by Egypt's security agencies are not accessible to Egyptians from inside Egypt. Uh, Egypt has one of the highest numbers of blocked websites in the whole world. The number is close to 600 now, and that includes 100% almost of independent critical media outlets. And all of these websites are blocked illegally, not even following Egypt's restrictive and abusive media laws. Multiple Egyptian laws allow authorities to censor online content without judicial approval and block any website considered to be a threat to national security. Out of your own experience, how did such laws restrict freedom of the press in Egypt? It started first uh, with uh, passing really an arsenal of abusive laws uh, that criminalized uh, content and particularly criminalized online expression, including that of media outlets. It started in 2015 with a very unusual anti-terrorism law amendment that really expanded the definition of terrorist acts and terrorist views to include anything and everything, including calling to change laws or calling to amend the constitution. Constitution or really expressing any views that are deemed to be against national unity, social peace, um, and uh, other such um, vague and uh, undefined terms. That was followed up with Egypt's first uh, cybercrime law that again was passed under President Sisi in 2018 that also introduced new crimes uh, like violating Egyptian family values or misusing social media and really transformed popular social media accounts into media organizations punishable by heavy sentences, including imprisonment. And then the president passed another law that set up new media entities, uh, on top of which is the Supreme Council for Media Regulation, that introduced very difficult and restrictive registration and licensing requirement for all media outlets, and for the first time applied these requirements to websites and online platforms. Uh, All of this has coincided also with the the uh, arrests and uh, prosecutions uh, of the journalists, uh, not just for what they publish in their own media outlets, but even for views that they express on their own social media accounts, an unprecedented increase in the number of prosecuting, really, we're talking about thousands of Egyptians for the crime of disseminating false information. I am someone who was also prosecuted for this uh, charge uh, several times. One of them actually sent me to court because of a tweet that I wrote about the conduct of the High Election Commission in the last uh, parliamentary elections, and I was prosecuted and convicted in court for writing this tweet uh, that was was deemed uh, to be a dissemination of false information. Everyone I know, whether a journalist, a lawyer, a human rights defender, a government critic, has at some point been charged, prosecuted, and or arrested for the crime of disseminating false information. That was uh, Hossam Bagat, Executive Director of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights and an investigative journalist at the Independent, Mada Masser. Uh, He spoke uh, with uh, VOA's Mohammed El Shanawi. As we just reported, tomorrow marks the 30th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day. Many media analysts stress the need to further strengthen protections for freedom of expression to ensure the fulfillment of fundamental human rights. In many parts of Africa, however, despite the long-standing recognition from both legal and socio-political perspectives, Freedom of expression remains threatened. Armal Gilbert Bukhaineza is a board member of the International Press Association of East Africa. VOA's Douglas Mpuga reached him by phone to talk about the organization's role. The International Press Association of East Africa uh, represents now around 
300 journalists across East Africa in different countries. Our main work now is to do advocacy for our colleagues in, in di- different countries. Like now, we have been advocate, advocating for Abdallah Mumin uh, is uh, is is the general secretary of uh, the syndicate of of journalists in Somalia. Uh, he has been facing so many threats, uh, arrests, uh, but now he he's in Nairobi. And yeah, and to have been also getting journalists in like in Burundi, yeah, in different countries. Of course, we support colleagues uh, like in terms of training, uh, safety, or, or because you know uh, the situation in East Africa and some countries like in Ethiopia, where the freedom space is very narrow. Like sometimes in uh, we train our colleagues to be how to be safe. And we, of course, we we publish sometimes freedom of speech and freedom of press in different countries of East Africa. That is uh, that is our one of our, our main our main work as the International Press Association of East Africa. Yes, as you say, members are from different countries in the region, and these countries have yes. different governance systems. How are they generally scoping in in those areas in those countries as far as press freedom is concerned? Hi, <laughs> that is a very serious question and a very serious matter for for our colleagues. For instance, you know, like in countries, let me say, like in a country like in Uganda, in Uganda, for example, international journalists, as we speak now, uh, you, you, to get like an accreditation, you have to pay one thousand US dollar, for example. So those are some measures that the government take to sometimes to to deny accreditations and visa uh, journalist visa for our colleagues. Like in Uganda, they ask for now uh, one thousand US dollar and a letter from Interpol, I think, to to get a journalist visa. So you see, sometimes they just yeah you you just give up. So uh, those are one of the measures that uh, some governments here. Attack to 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 discourage uh, the work of journalists in the region. Like in Ethiopia, you have you have journalists who has been jailed. Uh, a lot of them, you see, in Somalia, as I was speaking, uh, in Burundi, in Burundi now we have more than 100 journalists in exile till today, who can't go back in their country. So the, the the situation of journalists in the East Africa, in some part of East Africa, is is really critical. It's really really critical. Now, as the world marks World Free Press Day, what's your message to the leadership in those countries? The message the message is clear. We call we upon those authorities, those governments, to let journalists do their work properly, because journalism is not a crime. Unfortunately, some leaders are still struggling to understand that journalism is not a crime. Journalists, when journalists can do their work properly, even authorities, they are among beneficiaries of freedom, of freedom of of speech, of freedom of press. Our message is clear: let journalists do their work properly. That was Armel Gilbert Bukaineza, a board member of the International Press Association of East Africa. He spoke to my colleague Douglas Mpuga from Nairobi, Kenya. You're listening to Africa News Tonight. I'm Yehias Wuhib in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. For world news, check out voanews.com. Two. Kenyan preachers have appeared in separate courts accused of encouraging their followers to harm themselves to meet God. Kenyan authorities have exhumed the bodies of more than 100 people with post-mortems on 10 of them showing they died from starvation and lack of oxygen. Mohamed Yasuf reports from Nairobi, Kenya. Pastors Paul McKenzie and Ezekiel Odero appeared in court to answer charges that they allegedly killed their followers by urging them to fast to death in order to meet Jesus. 
Mackenzie and his accomplice were arrested after a judge in the town of Malindi declared that the court could not rule on terrorism charges preferred by the prosecution. The prosecution said last week that they would charge the pastor with radicalization and terrorism. The pastor was taken to the Shanzu Law Court in Mombasa, where judges hear terrorism-related cases. Mary Keithy, 46, was in court to witness the proceedings. Keithy is searching for her niece and her six children, who were followers of Mackenzie. <laughs> She said, I was in court to find out what the judge will rule and where our loved ones were. They disappeared. We have yet to relocate them, let alone their bodies. The children's mother called us three weeks ago, but we could not reach her when we called back. We have no idea where she is. She informed us that all of the children had died. Kenyan investigators have exhumed at least 110 bodies from the Shakahola forest along the coast where people met their deaths. Due to heavy rains in the forest, exhumation of the bodies has been temporarily halted, but efforts to rescue more survivors continue. More than 400 people have disappeared, according to the Kenyan Red Cross. Odero, who has been linked to the Shakahola deaths, appeared in Mombasa Law Court to answer for similar deaths in Kilifi County. The followers and supporters of Odero demanded his release. Mumina Alaso is a Kilifi County human rights defender. She says justice must be served to all those who died as a result of the pastor's misleading teachings. It really feels so bad that uh, most of the Ezekiel people have come to chant that they want the pastor to be released, while there are so many people who have lost their loved ones, uh, and there are some who have not even yet found their loved ones uh, with the cult uh, pastors. I feel uh, justice has to be done uh, for the people who have lost their lives, uh, being forced to fast, and um, even their children who are forced to fast. Odero's lawyers, led by Dunstan Omari, said no one has come forward to claim that the pastor killed any of his church members. Allegations have been put that the pastor is involved in taking bodies to Shakaola. I'm appealing to all Kenyans who have ever come to the church, who have ever brought their patients, who have ever brought a patient who has died, and that patient was taken to Shakaola to go to any nearest police station in the country and they give that evidence because up to now, none of those people who have ever taken uh, anybody to uh, for one year and a, one year and one month to uh, Bishop uh, Pastor Ezekiel's church. There is nobody. Odero will appear in court again Thursday, but it is unclear when Mackenzie will appear to answer terrorism-related charges. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. And uh, Uganda's parliament today passed one of the world's uh, strictest anti-LGBTQ bills, mostly unchanged, including long jail terms and the death penalty. President Yaware Museveni has asked parliament to tone down some parts of the original legislation. Despite limited changes, the new bill retains most of the harshest measures of the legislation adopted in March, which drew condemnation from the United States, European Union, United Nations, and major corporations. The provisions retained include the death penalty for so-called aggravated homosexuality and a 20-year sentence for promoting homosexuality. The legislation now heads back to Museveni, a vocal opponent of LGBTQ rights. He has signaled he intends to sign the legislation. And with that, we wrap up this edition of Africa News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in.